If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. That was shocking to see some of those clips from the movie The Exorcist. Movies featuring exorcisms like the movie The Exorcist 1973 and The Exorcism of Emily Rose 2005 have thrilled audiences around the world. But do demonic possessions actually happen in real life? That's proven to be a very difficult question to answer. The usual indications of demonic possession are often explained away by skeptics as being attributable to natural phenomena. Beast-like voices from the allegedly possessed are said to be the result of an unusual utilization of the vocal cords. Unnatural displays of strength are explained as bursts of energy due to adrenaline, and odd scratches and bite marks are often suspected to be self-inflicted, all signs of fraud or psychological disorders. Now those watching this video can see here we have right off the internet, and anyone can look this up and see it for themselves, this particular article is covering six cases of demonic possession that might convince you. And those six cases are, number one, the exorcism of Annalise Michael. Number two, the unresolved mystery of Pat reading. Number three, a reputable psychologist's account of Julia. Number four, Clara Germana, Selly, and her pact with Satan. Number five, the successful exorcism of Roland Doe slash Robbie Mannheim. Number six, the case of Latoya Ammon's children. Now, speaking of The Exorcist, I'm always reminded about how when I was still in high school back in the early 70s, I remember seeing the author of The Exorcist, William Peter Blatty, on a late night show. Maybe it was Johnny Carson or something like that. But I remember him saying that he based his novel, The Exorcist, which became the famous Hollywood movie, on an actual demon possession case which I thought was a little startling, but he really didn't go into much detail about it. But as we were preparing to do this video, I thought there might be some information about what he used, the author of The Exorcist, to uh, base his novel on, which is filled with a lot of fiction and Hollywood showmanship and stuff like that, stuff that didn't actually happen in a real demon possession case. But at the same time, he's basing his novel on actual demon possession cases. And for the viewing audiences out there, uh, he got it from a 1949 possession case titled The Haunted Boy. As you can see here, I just wanted to include it in this video, page by page, of that original demon possession story that William Peter Blatty used to create his famous novel. You can see here on one of the pages, there was a lot of news stories about this. Breaking the story of the haunted boy. I find that interesting because you have this haunted boy story from 1949, and it reminds you of the haunted houses that are out there. It's the same 
type of entities involved in both. And here we see who was this possessed kid and where did he really live? Inquiring minds want to know. Now, those of you reading this article or seeing this article here I'm referencing to can easily freeze frame your YouTube video and uh, read the article for yourself. Anyway, it's just fascinating that famous movies and things like that are actually coming from real demon possession stories that occurred in time, but were no way as dramatic as what you see in these Hollywood movie versions. This is sort of to set the table what's coming next. Well, I'm here with a dear brother in Christ, David Harrell. David Harrell has been associated with the same church I've been associated with since 1981 in my case. 82. 82 in your case. So I got you beat by just a little bit. But we're both members of Day Spring Fellowship, which is a Reformed Baptist church here in Austin, Texas, founded by Pastor Jackson Boyette. In fact, we're sitting in Jackson's very mm -hmm. office. Now, Jackson went to be with the Lord in 2011 due to a drunk driver, him and his wife. But uh, I'm sure he's much happier where he is now than where we are here, yeah. <laughs> still in this world. Yeah. Right, right. So anyway, uh, for our purposes, uh, David, I wanted you to give a little background as to your, your theological understanding, history, your association with Jackson Boy at the pastor of our church. And uh, then we're going to deal with some of your experiences in the demonic realm as your, your association with Jackson was. So okay. go ahead and give our audience that. Uh, Jackson and I first met in uh, 1973, where we both were students at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary. And uh, Jackson was at that time a member of the Assemblies of God. And mm -hmm. they had uh, told Jackson he wanted to be an Assemblies of God pastor. And they told Jackson, well, you need, a sem you need a seminary degree. And so he picked the closest with the home. And he went to Austin Presbyterian. Uh, you know what's funny is I was going to do the same thing you did, you and Jackson. Uh -huh. But then both of you said, no, don't go there. <laughs> well, it turned out to be very liberal. Exactly, and, and exactly. So I didn't know that. I, yeah, I didn't even know what liberal theology, theology was when we went there. Yeah. And uh, But anyway, we parted ways after we graduated. We graduated in 76, and I went down the little town near Corpus Christi and pastored a little Presbyterian church down there for four years in Jackson. Stayed here in town and got, had his ministry started, and Day Spring got started. And um, he was I also on the radio at that time. That's where I heard it. He was on the radio, on KIXL, so doing many things. Yes, uh, but we met up again um, around eighty one, eighty two in that area. I, I saw him one day down at the Ironworks. And I, we, I was eating uh, barbecue with some colleagues there from where I was working, and Jackson walked in. I went over and greeted him, and he invited us to go to Day Spring, and so. We had no idea, you know. I I, would, I still thought Jackson was was uh, a part of the charismatic movement, mm -hmm. you know. And so mm -hmm. we kept looking for a church we liked, we couldn't find one. So one Sunday we just I told my wife I said, well, let's just go. And I said they may be rolling in the aisles and jumping <laughs> off the windows for all I know, but let's just go. And it was the most wonderful, reformed, spirit theological rock. spirit of of yes. our experience. But um, Jackson had been brought by the Lord to the doctrines of the Reformed faith, mm -hmm. unbeknownst to me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and So you didn't see any rolling on the floor or no, barking no, like dogs no, no, no. or some of the best scenes? Any of that stuff heard. we have in our, our we've got a video we series some, on them. Yeah, we had some mutual friends, who, they were Orthodox Presbyterians and they knew Jackson and they told me one time, I was meeting with them to see what they were all about and they told me one time, I said, well you know Jackson Boy? I said, oh yeah. They said, well, Jackson's reformed. I said, no, he's not. <laughs> we used to have debates when we were in seminary together. And, and, uh, and I would say, Jackson, the reformed doctrines are the only scripture. Oh, no, 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 no. We never, it was never heated. We, we, but anyway, we, we became close friends. He and I became like brothers. Our wives, uh, both of them, my wife didn't have any sisters. Barbara was an only, she had a brother, but no sisters. And they became literally sisters. Mm -hmm. And it was like brothers and sisters. We traveled mm -hmm. together. We went to England together. We spent, we had an annual trip together every summer, and, mm -hmm. and so we just came, became very, very close. Mm -hmm. um, we had a we had a missionary from Dayspring who was a missionary to Papua New Guinea, 
and Jackson came to, I was an elder by that time, I was an elder at Spring, and, and uh, Jackson came to our house one night and he said, I've got to go to Papua New Guinea and counsel and be a pastor to our missionary. He really needs help. And so, um, and then he started telling us about this woman who was in the congregation and what he was dealing with there with her in terms of her de demonization. And uh, I'd never heard of that. I, I, I was just so you're talking about a demon possessed person. Well, so, anyway, so we've got a I've got a the video. The culture would probably call it demon demon possession. Yeah, right? I've got a video that's well seen on YouTube that deals with my own experience with the woman you're talking yeah. about. Right. Uh, you weren't there that night. No. It was at a Bible study. Yeah. But she, as you said, she was a member of the church. Mm -hmm. But in in fact, you have well, described was, to me at church one day the horrific background of what led to this situation. And then I told you, I don't want that to be on our video, right. <laughs> but it well, was pretty was, terrible. I mean, I couldn't believe it. basically sent to the church to try to destroy it. Yeah, yeah. That was. Here's a clip from that demon possession video I mentioned. The experience I had in relation to this message had to do with the only actual demon possession case I have ever personally witnessed. Back in the mid-1980s, I was in charge of our church sermon tapes and the church library. The church tapes were kept at my home on wooden racks in what I called my evangelism room. One night, multiple members of our church and some visitors came over to my home for a Bible study, including my pastor. In the middle of the Bible study, one of the visitors a middle-aged woman jumped up and ran out of the front living room screaming. The woman raced back through my house and into my evangelism room where the sermon and study tapes were stored. I was totally amazed, quite shocked to be frank, but my pastor seemed to know what was going on and he got up and started running after her. Once I saw that, I and several other church members got up and raced after the pastor. The screaming woman had gone directly to the stored tapes and immediately grabbed this one tape out of the hundreds that were there and was trying to destroy it when we arrived. We struggled with the woman, at least five of us. We were all the five good-sized men. I'm six foot tall and I think I was just as tall as everyone else, my pastor and other church members, we had to pull her out of the room. We pulled the tape, this tape that you're about to listen to, uh, out of her hand, and then we had to physically restrain her in the other room while we prayed over her, while she's making all these strange uh, guttural noises and screaming in strange languages. But uh, after five or ten minutes of praying over and holding her down at the same time. It took five of us to hold her down. She suddenly became quiet and subdued. And then a few minutes later, she came to in her normal understanding, you might say, in her normal self, and didn't remember a thing. I think this was an actual demon possession case. And it turned out that my pastor said that this woman had come from South America where she had been involved in some of these strange religions down there where they're dedicated to Satan and other occultic religious rites. And somehow this impacted her life. I believe a demonic manifestation took place in my house where the demon actually led this person to destroy this message given by our pastor. And so I think if the devil goes through all that trouble just to destroy the message, I felt like it's my Christian duty to make sure that message goes out to as many people who will hear it. Uh, but anyway, this is the first time I'd heard anything about that. I knew who he was talking about, but I didn't know anything about, about the background. But he said, I need somebody to take my place while I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm willing to do it. I said, but, but uh, I want to start now mm -hmm. working with you because I don't want to go in there you know, not knowing anything and be dealing with this. So I started that very, I guess the next week maybe, uh, with him meeting in a the person the woman we were we, we had a, she had a woman counselor and this woman counselor was a, a psychologist but she met under 
her office was in the offices of a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And so she would meet, meet with her, and then we, they would meet together, then we would come in, and that's when all the demons would, would manifest, and that's when we would start dealing with them. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you talk about uh, demonic manifestations, what are we talking about here for viewers that don't know any of this stuff? It's almost impossible to describe, but you're talking one minute to a person that you know, a person that you care about, that you love, and uh, the next minute you're talking, she's talking to you, the face changes, the eyes change, the voice changes, and they come at you trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. Choking, kicking, biting, gouging. What about the voices? Did you hear any voices coming out of her mouth? Oh yeah. I mean, her voice completely changed. There would be male voices, there would be female voices, there would be little child voices. Was there any cursing or anything like that? <laughs> Threats? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's all there was. Yes, it, it wasn't too kind of bad. Now, you cursing mentioned to me in a previous conversation that Jackson would say something like, I'll summon the smiters. In reference to the term smiters used by my pastor, Jackson Boyette, the verse that he uses to justify this can be found in this passage. In fact, this clip here from Daniel chapter 10 is from our haunted house video. And so what we have here is there's one angelic being trying to get a message to Daniel, but he can't get through because a demonic spirit is holding him up. So another angelic spirit or angel came, helped him to break through the demonic barrier. The smiter is a stronger angel that can actually push the stronger demonic entities out of the way. Much similar to mankind, where you have some are rulers, some are slaves, some can do more than others, some have different gifts of IQ than others. Well, in the demonic and angelic realms, there are abilities that these angelic beings or demonic beings have that vary. There are some angels that are stronger than other angels and can deal with demonic entities on a different level than other angelic beings. Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 14, verses 20 and 21. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And also here in Daniel chapter 10, but now, in verses 20 and 21, we read, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Is that right? Well, Jackson was far more knowledgeable than I was, and some of the stuff he got, I don't know. Let me say here, I think it's important for the public to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, because most, even Christians today, don't understand the depth of the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, remember, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8, that ye must be born again. What he meant by that, and you can check this in cross-reference to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, is when you become a true Christian, you are born again by the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually comes and then dwells in the believer, and suddenly he has divine power given to him by God. That's the differentiation between someone who's saved and someone who's not saved. Even if they claim to be a Christian, if they're not born again and they have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling in their soul, if they don't have that, they're not a Christian. And this goes back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But anyway, let me give you a quick rundown here about some biblical information about the Holy Spirit. 
the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One, the Holy Spirit is God, and God has personality. The Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has feelings. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a distinct role. The sent one, sent by the Father and Son. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Holy Spirit is another helper. The Spirit interacts with the Father and Son. The Spirit feels, speaks, and interacts with us. The Spirit is inseparable from the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is God, and God has personality. The Holy Spirit is divine, but not a separate God. He has a personality because God does. The Spirit was present at creation. But the issue here is whether or not the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. The Holy Spirit has a mind. The Holy Spirit has feelings. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a mind. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. He knows and performs the activity of searching all things, even the deep things of God. Romans 8, 27. He possesses a mind. 1 Corinthians 2.13 He can teach people. Matthew 11.27 No one person knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Obviously from that statement, God has not chosen to reveal everything to everybody on the face of the earth, only to certain people who have been born again and are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The context is earth, not heaven. Otherwise, to be consistent, the cherubim in God's direct presence do not know God either. The Holy Spirit has feelings. Ephesians 4.30, he can be grieved. Hebrews 10.29, he can be insulted. Acts 15.28, he can think things are good. While Jehovah's Witnesses might claim these are just hyperbole, Scripture simply presents these as fact. Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. He chooses to give gifts to some. Notice, to some, not all. Acts 16, 6 through 11. He directs activities of Christians. Romans 8, 26, he intercedes, prays for the saints. The Holy Spirit has a distinct role. 1 John 5, 6, the Spirit testifies. Hebrews 10, 15, the Holy Spirit witnesses to us. Romans 8, 26 through 27, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Acts 2, 17, I will pour out my Spirit. Acts 28, 25, the Holy Spirit spoke to your forefathers, through Isaiah the prophet. Distinctiveness at baptism. That's found in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, Mark chapter 1, 9 through 11, and John chapter 1, 32 through verse 33. The Holy Spirit speaks not of himself, per se, but unto Jesus and the truth. John 16, 13, quote, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Now, of course, he's hearing from the Father and the Son, members of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the sent one, sent by the Father and Son. John 14, 26, quote, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, the Father gave us the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5, God gave us the Holy Spirit. Galatians 4, 6b, God sent for the Spirit of His Son. John 14, 16 through 17, also John 14, 26. Father sent the Holy Spirit after Jesus prays. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. John 15, 26, But when the Helper comes, whom I, Jesus Christ, shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is another Helper. 
John chapter 14, 16 through 18. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. The Spirit interacts with the Father and the Son. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Intercedes for us with groanings. 1 Corinthians 2.10 Searches the deep things of God. Luke 4.1 The Spirit filled Jesus and led Jesus into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4 verse 14a Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. Luke 11.13 The Father gives the Holy Spirit. Father and Son are distinct. Spirit of the Father. Luke 11.13 Spirit of His Son. Galatians 4.6b of Christ, Romans 8, 9, and John 16, 7. Now, if the Holy Spirit were not God, there couldn't be blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Son versus the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Also, Mark chapter 3, 28 through 29, and also Luke 12, 10. So we see that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed and Jesus says that's an unforgivable sin. So you're talking about very God here when you're talking about the Holy Spirit, who's the third member of the Blessed Trinity. Okay, the Spirit feels, speaks, and interacts with us. The Holy Spirit speaks, Acts chapter 10, verse 19. Also Acts 13, 2, Hebrews 3, 7, Revelation 22, 17, John 16, 13, Romans 8, 26 through 27, Matthew 10, 20, Mark 13, 11. He speaks directly, person to person. Acts 10, 19 through 21. He can be lied to. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Ananias and Sapphira learned that lesson the hard way in Acts chapter 5 and following. He is our helper with a masculine pronoun in the Greek. Pneuma, spirit, is neuter. Yet Greek grammar was deliberately violated to talk about spirit, he, in John 14, 6. Other cases of this may be John 15, 26, John 16, 7 through 8, Ephesians 1, 14 through 15, Galatians 4, 6b. God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Conclusions on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us and searches the deep things of God. The Spirit intercedes for us, so forth. Point two, the Spirit filled Jesus. Then three, if you believe the Father and Son are two distinct persons, then in Matthew 28, 19, the Spirit has to be distinct from at least one of them. You can just freeze frame the, the screen here and read that and look up those verses. Also, more Bible verses. Once again, freeze frame your screen and check out those verses in relation to the Holy Spirit and the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are not three different gods, but one eternal God within the nature of that one eternal God are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thus, to make this clear then, you don't need to be certified as a exorcist or get some kind of certificate saying you can cast out demons or use some special process to get rid of demons. No, if you're a born-again Christian, you have the power of God Almighty within you as the Scripture teaches. You have the Holy Spirit, which is more powerful than the demons. So, in my own case, I had an encounter with a demon-possessed person who had multiple demons. I didn't run from the situation. I actually had control on the situation. And that was only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Had I not had the Holy Spirit, I would have been overrun by the demons. It's just that simple. You can't beat the demons if you don't have the Holy Spirit. They were inferior to God's power. Given the names, I was given... Uh, we were dealing with one demon one time, had him down on the floor, and we were wrestling around trying to hold her down and trying to address this demon. And, and I just shouted out, Ola Mathetes, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And he came out like that. Mm -hmm. But you had to get the name right. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so the next day, Jake Jackson called me up and he says, where in the world did you get that name, Ola Mathetes? And he said, it's Greek. And I said, I don't know, it just popped out of my mouth, you know. He says, I looked all over the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, I can't find that word. Well, what mm. it means in Greek is total disciple. Mm. You know, it means whole disciple or something. So this, mm. this personality of the, this woman 
we should say probably here, I don't know if you've talked about her multiple personality. She was a multiple. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that if you want. But, but this particular personality had this particular demon, and the Lord gave me a name. So you're saying this woman was uh, possessed by multiple demons. Oh, yeah. It's sort of like what Jesus encountered with legion yeah. in the, in the oh, Gospels. Oh, yeah. The Gerasene demoniac. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Verse 5, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you, by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, that's talking about Jesus, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he, that's Jesus, did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. She had multiple personalities. There were adult female personalities. So what you're saying is when you said that one name, that Greek name, yeah. That particular demon was exercised right on the spot. He left right then. And that but one, that still meant the other ones were there. Oh yeah, the other ones did. We had to go through and had to address them name by name, personality by personality. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we did, I was with it for two years, and then I, my company sent me out to Phoenix uh, mm -hmm. every week, and, and I couldn't do it anymore. But I, I think Jackson finally got some kind of resolution, but I don't know that it was ever complete mm -hmm. deliverance. So now this goes back to what I was saying on YouTube. I posted my only experience with a demon possession case yeah. with this woman you're talking about, yeah. not really knowing much about it. Well, and then she shows demon. up at the Bible study, and the, the demon manifests, yeah. manifests itself. And if anyone wants to get a, a full story about that, look for my video called Demon Possession. Yeah. And uh, it... It'll all be there, but now David here is corroborating <laughs> that this goes along with what I was saying. The answer about the smiters, there was a particular personality and a particular really bad demon that we were dealing with. Um, and I don't know where Jackson got it. I never did ask him, but, but he would call for the angels. He would mm -hmm. say, Lord, send the angels to help us. And did that this, intimidate the demons? Oh, yeah. And then the smiters was a particular type of angel who would come and punish them. 
And when Jackson said, do you want me to call for the smiters, that would usually calm him down because they didn't want to go through what, what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. but okay. This is going on, but, but we'll, we'll, the unseen, what we can't see is we can mere see. mortals, but there's the supernatural warfare that's we can, going on. We can, I've never seen anything like this. I've got tapes of sessions and so forth, but not video, audio tape. But, mm -hmm. but there were times when the smiters came Mm -hmm. And you've never heard such screaming and yelling and howling in your life. Well, you know, I always thought that movie, The Exorcist, the, the guy that wrote that fictional book and made a movie out of it, yeah. but he said that he actually used actual demon possession cases and just took the most fantastic, sensational episodes to and, and put it all together in that movie. You know, one of the, one of the strangest things, I guess, one of the, early on when I... First, I didn't tell a lot of people. Of course, my wife knew it. I didn't tell a lot of people what I was doing, but I, I gradually began to talk to other people, other believers and so forth. And, and uh, what surprised me was they were more interested in what the demons were doing than they were in what the Lord was doing. Exactly. It's, but it's just the curiosity. Thing. Exactly. It's because it's so... I, I have a feeling so that... ...foreign and so curious that right? people just think, well... I have a feeling that this haunted house video that this clip is going to show up in is going to get a lot of views. I might be wrong, but... I'm thinking it will only because of the curiosity factor yeah, that people have. And it's not because they really care that much about yeah. God. It's yeah. they're more curious about the devil and the demons and well, all I that type some, of stuff. I, 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 there were some books on demonology that I read, and but um, what I learned, I, I've written some a paper on this myself based on what Jackson and I experienced, but what I learned was mostly firsthand. I mean, I went in there not knowing what was going to happen. Right. But, I mean, the, the first night, I was given the ability to go against it, go against them, you know. Now, mm -hmm. the, what people need to understand, for believers especially who might hear this, you've got to understand that the demons are more powerful than us as humans. Mm -hmm. But if we have the Holy Spirit, they are not more powerful than us. The Holy Spirit controls well, them. Well, it goes, it goes and it's according to what the Bible says. The Bible always, states It's always with the demons a power structure. You've got to mm -hmm. realize that in the demonic world, there is a structure. Mm -hmm. And you've got these really, you've got Satan, first of all, and then you've got all his demons, but there is a definite structure there. Mm -hmm. and, and, but none of them, even Satan himself, are more powerful than the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So Amen. if we have the Holy Spirit, we don't have to be afraid of the demons. That's right. And we can command them in the name of the Holy Spirit to come out of whatever they're doing or to stop what they're doing. And and I've had times when I've had to I've had to rebuke them because they were affecting me personally, you know. Right. And you, right. you know, I've had to do the same thing. And you rebuke them in the name of Jesus and Amen. Well, it's all over the scripture. You're looking in the Gospels, the, the, yeah. Jesus, the disciples, the epistles. Yeah. Uh, the disciples are able to do that. Kind of, except people that don't have the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's They're like the seven mean. sons of Stephen <laughs> in the book of Acts. <laughs> that was an unfortunate situation for those guys. Situation. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, seven sons of one Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Many also of those who had believed kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices. And many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. 
and they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Um, I sincerely believe if it weren't, uh, and somebody told me, a friend of mine that I worked with, that he was a kind of a, a counselor, psychologist type person. He told me he, he had heard about it. I told him a little bit about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was a believer. Mm -hmm. And he said, man, you, you, you need to get out of this. And I said, you don't understand this. If I weren't a believer, I'd already be dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it, it, it's but, amazing. But unbelievers don't understand. Right, this. right. And, and to, for me, that one demonic experience I had, and that's the only one I've had in my life, because praise the Lord, <laughs> Lord, it seems every, like the Lord puts a hedge around me. So I, don't, I had it every week for two years. At least. Yeah, and that and is... Jackson had it longer. Than it now. took me after that experience, which is in that video that, yeah. that we've got on YouTube on demon possession. Uh, it took me a lot two or three weeks to just get over it. You know, it's like, that was heavy well, duty spiritual warfare that just the, the, messed me the, up. <laughs> what I want to ask you here is, uh, there are a lot of Christians out there that just don't seem to think that there's really a supernatural aspect going on. They, you know, they, they read about demons and everything all over the place in the yeah. scripture and it's supernatural, but they don't seem to want to believe it in because, right. you, because no, you're going to edit this so you can edit this out if you want to but with the advent of liberal theology mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is taken out of the picture mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. and so when you do that you've got people who've grown up in the church but they don't realize what the work of the Holy Spirit is mm -hmm. they don't realize that it's Father, Son and Holy Spirit so they they recognize Father and Son, but they just dismiss that. When you do that, you just make a pathway for the demonic to come yeah, in because right. you've got no way to fight against them. That's right. Now, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that enables us. Of he, course. He gives us the weapons of our warfare. Now, the topic that this clip is going to be in, mm -hmm. that we're talking about, it, uh, the main video is on haunted houses right. and in the yeah. demonic realm and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But most people don't want to believe in the demons and stuff. I often said, well, unbelievers can't believe in the demons because if they believe in them, they're going to have to believe in God. <laughs> and the whole idea is to get rid of God, so you got to get rid of the Look demons too. Halloween is. Yeah, yeah. They do know they're out there. Yeah. They just want to celebrate it. They don't want to, they don't want to fight it. But right, you know, right, right. Halloween is the absolute worst holiday that doesn't so, even been. So if you're talking to some of these people that claim to be Christians, yet they, they don't accept anything demonic or supernatural interfering in the physical world that we're living in at this moment. Uh, what would you say to convince them that, you know, wait a minute, this stuff actually goes beyond the supernatural and the unseen into the physical world, which is what I'm arguing that that happens in haunted houses. But see, I, would write, I would write where they are until the things we're talking about started happening. Uh -huh. And what uh -huh. I would say to them is, you haven't been where I've been. <laughs> That's right. See, it's like a, it's like a it's like a GI coming back from World War II trying to tell the ones over here who didn't go what it was like on the front lines. That's right. That's right. Where you're where you're fighting every day for your life and where everything is is. is you, totally that couldn't right. be a, a better point because because I experienced from the same person. What you've been talking about, I mean, I am totally relating to what you're saying because I've been there myself, like a veteran <laughs> in a war. Now, the viewers need to understand that this person, she was not a bad person. When she wasn't? When she wasn't being demonized. Blunt, and when it, when it was her personality, yeah. now you, you know, people don't believe in split personalities. I guarantee you they, they exist. When it was her in her right mind, without the influence of the demons, she was one of the sweetest, nicest ladies you'd ever talked well, about. Well, that's why she was at my Bible yeah. study. She was with the church at my house at yeah. a Bible study. She was a great person. And all of a sudden, the demonic manifested itself. And she went straight, because I was a tape minister back yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, she went straight to my, she'd never been in my house before. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, when she became a demonized, she just jumped up, her face changed, everything like you've been talking about. And just immediately went into my house where she'd never been in before. Went right to where the room was. I had the tape ministry yeah, she had and grabbed the one tape that Jackson had warned me before that 
she well, might, the demons might try to destroy the temple. You entry for that, right? She hadn't been there, but the demons had. Exactly. They exactly. Did. And it was amazing. Yeah. Within a, a span of just a few seconds, she jumps, goes into my house that she's never been in her life, went exactly to where my uh, tape racks were. And I had a bunch of tape racks. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hundreds of tapes. Mm -hmm. And that, that demon-possessed person just grabbed the one tape mm -hmm. that Jackson previously had warned me that the demons might try to destroy. Yep. And that was the battle. Because now we're trying to get that tape out of her hand. People, people uh, don't believe in angels, but we would put her in a chair like that one over there, kind of, yeah. and and she would start trying to kick us and hit us, you know. And, mm -hmm. say, and Jackson or I would say, "Lord, please bind her hands and the hands would go." Mm -hmm. Like, she mm -hmm. couldn't move them. She couldn't turn loose mm -hmm. arms of the chair. Mm -hmm. And she start trying to kick us, you know, and start yeah, yeah, yeah. us and all that kind of stuff. Well, one night, I, I, we would kneel right in front of her. I mean, we'd mm -hmm. get down right in front of that chair, and we'd be kneeling on the floor. Are, are, the are you saying that, did this, some of this happen in this office, or was it somewhere else? No, it was else? somewhere else. Okay. okay. Where we were meeting. But I remember one particular time, I was right in front of that chair. She put both her hands around my neck. She was trying to choke me to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all I did was I just said, Lord, Please make the demons remove his hands from my neck. Yes. And my hands just went. Like well, you know, I believe because, uh, and I've, I think I've mentioned this in some of my tapes on Mormonism, but I've got a whole playlist on YouTube on Mormonism, for instance. And sometimes when I would feel demonic oppression, because I would have my living room full of Mormon missionaries. And one night we had this, they brought in this big gun that was a, a Mormon temple war, a person that was an upper echelon type of guy. And I could just feel, you know, in my spirit, man, I could almost feel the demonic presence, of, especially that temple guy. And, and I had to pray while they're talking and doing all this stuff. I'm sitting here praying for the Lord to just control what I felt to be, and the same with my, my mom. She was into witchcraft and mm -hmm. occultism, and when I would go to visit her during spring break from the university uh, over there, I could feel the same presence in my own house that I grew up in, yeah. and I would do the same thing. I'd have to pray the Lord to mm -hmm. restrict the demonic because the oppression in the house, to me, was so great that I had to pray. You don't to, feel like you can breathe. Maybe. Yeah, and, and just to go to sleep at night when I would spend the night at my parents' house. You know, it's like, ugh, you know. Uh, so that presence is real, but uh, I think a lot of these Christians out here don't even relate what we're talking about, and they just don't think it's actually going on, but it's like that great analogy you brought up about veterans in a war. Well, that's why I keep going back and saying this is the Word of God. And so many people who are Christians today have not... They've taken away the sola scriptura, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, out of the, the, the liberal theology has taken sola scriptura out of it, mm -hmm. and and they it's all now psychology, it's all psychology uh, and whatever you know. happens to be the movement of the moment. But, right. But, but, but you wanted to talk about haunted houses and things like that. Now that was the correlation. That's the, okay. probably the final thing we'll talk about here because. Yeah. I correlate the haunted house that my dad grew up because my uh, grandmother was practicing this occultic yeah. books and arts, just casting spells a yeah. whole bit. And that's why the house was infested with demonic activity. Yeah. So there's a correlation between what you do yeah. and, 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 and it's almost like summoning demons. So give us a... In that situation you're that you're talking about where a person is wanting them there, Yes. They invite them in. Well, that's because they get power. They yeah, think they, they get, get power, power from the, the spirits. They like that. Yes. The people that, that get that power like that. Now, as long as as long as they don't disobey what the demons tell them to do. Mm -hmm. Once they disobey what the demons tell them to do, the demon can kill them. Mm -hmm. I mean, like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 a, it's, and it's not just haunted houses. They can haunt a house. Um, just, this person that we're talking about loved to go to cemeteries at mm -hmm. night, and she would just hang around those cemeteries. Well, it's like Legion in the Scripture, yeah. where he she, hung out in the cemetery yeah. and, and the, among the tombs. Yeah, and she would, she would come up and she would have something with some little. One time it was a little cup or some kind or something like that, and that she found out there in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, "Where'd you find that?" And she said, "No, I found it in the cemetery." And I said, well, hmm. 
Can I have it? <laughs> no. no, no, no. This is the same principle behind rabbit's feet, mm -hmm. behind anything that someone or gives us or it's something that we have that we think is going to bring us good luck, we think it's going to help us get well, we think it's going to help do something else. I read a story one time in one of the books on demonic uh, oppression that the person, the pastor who was dealing with this person, I think it was a woman, she had in her purse a little rock mm -hmm. and it had been worn smooth and polished by her rubbing that rock mm -hmm. and he mm -hmm. asked her about it and she said, my grandfather gave me that when I was a little girl. And she said, I got hurt. And he reached down and picked up this rock and he said, if you will rub that rock mm. when you get hurt, it'll take all the pain away. And she kept that in there all her life. It's fascinating you say that because in my own dad's own testimony in our main video, mm -hmm. he said that when he'd get a sty in his eye or some other, you know, his grandmother, his mother, my grandmother, would take a wedding ring, mm -hmm. rub it or something, say these other incantations. Mm -hmm. And he said that style would just, bang, it was gone. Yeah. Just like that. See, now that's what I'm talking about. Things that actually transfer into our physical realm where we are. Mm -hmm. You know, these things are going on, but like I said already, your analogy of a veteran that's been mm -hmm. on the front lines, yeah. he can describe it, but he can't really have the other person. So they can just, yeah. if they're going through life and nothing really out of the ordinary is going on, they don't seem to notice it or even care. Yeah. But when you start seeing these things, and it's actually transferring into the physical realm that we're in, then all of a sudden you're kind of going, oh, what is that? What is, what, what, what's going on here? Okay, with all that said, I, I, I promise you we're trying to keep this short. But, but, uh, but anyway, the, uh, the beauty is uh, what I'd like to do now, because you came up with some great points, is have you just conclude on this whole matter of, uh, demonic activity in this world uh, and just kind of reiterate maybe a few things you said and come to a conclusion on the matter to help our viewers out there understand that this supernatural activity by the demonic realm is ordained by God and allowed to take place by God but God has the ultimate power yeah. and it's all in his providence in his own purposes but anyway I'll let you yeah. speak on the, this uh, the key to it all is you got to be a Christian if you're not, if you if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're at their mercy of the demons, mm -hmm. because you got nothing to stand on. I mean, uh, these things are far more powerful than a human. And when you go over to like Papua New Guinea or India or yeah. some of these other places, there's a lot of demon demon activity over there, and they attribute it to the gods. It's worse here. There's no oh, really? There's no difference from here than there is in Papua New Guinea or someplace like that. You know, more obvious over there, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Go it's more abortion. obvious in the physical go, realm. Go to an abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go into any of the inner cities. In our well, you know, we, our missionary... Go in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. I mean, so, it, it, everybody thinks always, well, this is something that happens over, over there. No, 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 it's happening right here in this country, and it's, it's getting worse. You know, one of the most fascinating things I ever heard, basically, was one of our missionaries, David Sitton. He was at my house one night, and we were just talking and having a great fellowship time. And, and then he said, Larry, I admire you more than me being out in Papua New Guinea, cutting through the jungles yeah. with a machete or going down a river, crocodile-infested yeah. rivers in a canoe because you're over here in America, and it's worse here yeah. than, <laughs> than out there with the witch doctors and the headhunters. Let, let, me, let me close with an account of Jackson, what Jackson told me. Jackson and Barbara went to England, just as a trip, you know. Yeah. And uh, when he got back, we were in meeting one of the sessions with this person, and, mm -hmm. and one of the personalities came out, and mm -hmm. sat there and just stared at Jackson, just kept staring at him. Mm -hmm. And Jackson looked at her and he said, I'm not supposed to be here, am I? And she said, no. Mm -hmm. And he said, that guy in the restroom was supposed to kill me, wasn't he? And she said, yes. He had gone into a public restroom in England. There was a man in there who was supposed to kill him. Mm. Couldn't do it. Couldn't get the job done. That's amazing. Because of the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. Okay. See, that's okay. the power of God over the demonic realm, and you get that all over the scripture. And what's interesting about that is one night at the, I, a lot of, most people that know me know I work at the post office on that. I've been doing that at the time of this video session. Yeah. Been working here for 32, almost 32 and a half years now. But uh, I'd say about 15 years ago, somewhere, uh, this postal worker came to the post office and tried to force his way in. He was stopped at the door and uh, they had to get some extra help to hold it. The guy was like 300 pounds, ex Air Force. And they had to call the police and it took the police tasering him three times to get him down. And they asked him, why did he come there? And he said, God sent me to take care of that Larry Wessels guy. Yeah. God sent me to take care of that Larry Wessels guy. And I yeah, happened but, to Jackson more than once. Yeah, and, and I'll never forget that because I'm, I generally work six nights a week. And then I also have other jobs, and I'm trying to do this ministry too. You know, so I'm just a busy guy. I'm hyperactive, you know. Yeah. But God made me that way, so yeah. what can I say? But anyway, tying in with what you said. So the guy's trying to get in to, quote, take care of me. Uh, he stopped at the door. He ends up at the uh, the, the police department, and then, uh, several months later, he just passed away. So he was gone. But uh, I, people said, well, how do you know God didn't tell him to take care of you that night? And I said, well, because I work six nights a week, and he came on the only night I was off. <laughs> so I said, well, it had to be not God, but... The other guy implying it was Satan <laughs> that sent him, not God. <laughs> so, it's just common sense, right? But I know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, now, it's been 20 years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Since, we, since all this happened. Well, so, same for me, because that lady, that was way back. Yeah. Um, anybody who's listening, if you're not a believer, you need to get on your knees and you need to confess your sins, and you need to ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life. Amen. Uh, you need, if you are a believing Christian, but you don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit, you need to ask the Lord Jesus to help you understand what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity who was sent to us on the day of Pentecost for the purpose of being right here with us. I mean, he's right here with us in this room. He's with mm -hmm. us and he's outside us. And and, and uh, the American Christian needs to relearn who and what the Holy Spirit is and what he does and how he does it. Mm -hmm. And and we can't make him do things. He, he's not here at our beck and call. He's mm -hmm. here to do the bidding of the Father and of the Son. And the, the three agree, you know, and mm -hmm. he's here to carry out the plan. And uh, so, if you're if you're either not a Christian, you need to be, you need to be converted. If you're you need to seek it, and if you are a Christian, you need to ask the Lord to help you understand the work of the Holy Spirit. If you don't already do that, on the other hand, if you're a Christian, um, you really should. Jackson would go out and anoint houses with oil. Mm -hmm. He would go to the door. He would. Put some oil in the, in the well. He anointed my mantle. He anointed my son Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. And people. I mean, we would, he would anoint people because he believed strongly in the Scripture, where it says, "If anyone among you is sick, let him, let him call for the elders of the church, let them anoint them with oil, and lay hands over them, and they should be healed." In fact, that's ha that happened at, in my son. He's got severe brain damage. He was having epileptic type mm -hmm. seizures, and they were increasing until they were only like six month, minutes apart. Mm -hmm. He'd gone to three different hospitals. Mm -hmm. None of the doctors could. Help my son, and then Jackson and the elders. You might have been with them that I don't night. Remember. I don't remember. I know. So that was back in 1982. <laughs> you were, okay, yeah, you wouldn't have been at that time. You just got shown some. Anyway, so it looked like my son was about to die. The doctors couldn't uh, saw help him any way. So Jackson came over, anointed him with all the, the elders prayed over him, and the very next day we took him to the uh, the the children's hospital in uh, Houston, Texas. He hadn't been to that one. And, and uh, the very next day, they gave him medication and he never had a, he's been perfectly healthy as far as his situation goes since then. I still 
now for at the time of this recording, I've been changing his diapers, feeding him everything for 36 years straight. He's still with us. He's happy. He laughs and everything. He can't walk or talk because of his condition. But all that went away within, I would say, within 12 hours after the, the, you know, the prayer. It's not a call that... It's not a cause and effect thing. We can't control the Holy Spirit. We don't tell Him what. Exactly. To do. Exactly. So it's not. We're not saying if you go do this, if you go and don't them, then this has got to happen. That's the mistake right. the charismatic make. Right. Right. And the name it and claim it, people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about submitting ourselves and speaking to Him and to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father. I pray to all three, and I ask, sometimes I ask the Holy Spirit, "Will you come and do this?" Sometimes I ask the, the Lord Jesus. Who was Stephen was talking to when he was being stoned to death? Uh, I don't remember. The Lord Jesus. Yeah, the Lord Jesus. Acts chapter seven. Yeah, so that we have a triune God. The yeah. other thing I would I would say to parents, American parents today, is, is caution, especially if you have children. Um, be aware. Be on the lookout. Again, we can go back to the soldiers in battle. Mm -hmm. When they're in the foxholes and so forth, there's always a sentry mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. You got to become the sentry for your family. Mm -hmm. You got to be the sentry for your children. You got to understand the workings of Satan. You got to understand the workings of God. But you have to watch out for your children. Mm -hmm. And I see so many parents today, especially at Halloween. Oh my gosh, find something else for your children to do on Halloween night. If they want to dress up in a costume, okay, but none of this ghoulish, mm -hmm. uh, that is an evil night. Well, they don't realize how close to the demonic. Oh, that really Halloween, when we were dealing with this person, Halloween yeah. was her favorite holiday. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. she went out all for it. Mm -hmm. And if you think there aren't demons out and, and they aren't super active around that period of time, then you got to, you so, really don't understand. So the bottom line for unbelievers that refuse to believe in Christ, which is really the only way of salvation and deliverance from the demons and the power of Satan, they're, they're, is if they experience in the physical realm some of the supernatural power of the demonic, yeah. they shouldn't hang around it. If nothing else, at least for their own temporary personal safety, yeah. get, a far, get as far away from it as they possibly can. Like Ouija boards and all this stuff, anything that related to the occult, you need to get away from it, yeah. even if you refuse to come to Christ, which is really the only way to, to save your soul and your, protect your own safety. But at that moment, get flee. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, any form of religion that does not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Well, every false religion in the world is inspired by Satan, the devil. There, there's only one true religious faith, and that's in Jesus Christ who... Sola Scriptura, the, the, the Scripture, the, the Bible alone. All these other religions that are out there, there's only one real force behind it. That's why in our, our modern America, you can have uh, liberals politically supporting, let's say, Islam, mm -hmm. but they hate Christianity. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, why would they... These guys are supposed to be atheists and, and skeptics and stuff, but yet at the same time, they're supporting these other weird religion anything but christianity and but then when i realized well it's the same power yeah. behind yeah. these atheists as it is behind false religions the so, other the other thing I, and a lot of these things i had to learn and i learned in the process of going through all this with jackson of course he was he was more advanced in terms of spiritual knowledge and the understanding of all these things than i was at the time but uh, one of the things i had to learn was the pervasive presence of satan he he's got agents and demons and whatever else everywhere and so you can't escape him by going to the next town going to the next city or whatever they are they're not there's a physical world and there's a spiritual world and the spiritual world is divided satan was cast out of heaven mm -hmm. there's a there's a passage in well, it's Revelation chapter 12. Well, it's not Revelation, I'm thinking about. It's an Old Testament passage. It's Ezekiel 28, I think. Ah, yes. Where it talks about, when we read that to the demons, and they just howled. You know, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Jackson would say, you were hurled out of heaven. Right. You know, I always remember Ezekiel 28 and correlation to Isaiah 14. Because I always go, 14 
times two yeah. is twenty eight. Yeah. So you got Ezekiel twenty eight, Isaiah fourteen mm -hmm. also yeah, deals. Read that passage. Yeah. There, there was a particular difficult demon we were dealing with, very powerful and Jackson would read that passage to him and say, you were hurled out of heaven. He would just howl. Yeah. I mean, it was just yeah. Yeah. awful. Well, to be in sublime glory with God himself in heaven and to be cast from that, yeah. that's going to be, that's, that's eternal mental torment for them for all eternity yeah. as well. Yeah. Most Americans don't think of, don't, a lot, I will say most, I don't know how many, but a lot of Americans don't even realize there is a spiritual world. Exactly. Exactly. You've got to get over the idea that everything's physical. Everything's exactly. physical. There is physical world. There's also a spiritual world. The spiritual world is divided. You've got the world of Satan. you got the world of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you know what, The battle 16th, never stops. The night I got born again on May 16, 1981, and I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, that was a, that spiritual transformation that night. Reading a Roman Catholic Bible <laughs> off of a reference from a Hal Lindsey book. <laughs> but I got born again uh, in uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 3. It says, in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, uh, lovers of pleasures, and uh, you know, disobedient to parents, and all of a sudden they got down to that last one, having a form of religion, but to but denying the power thereof. And that's the verse I was convicted of my sin. Yeah. Yeah. I was born again. I dropped on my knees crying, Lord Jesus, save me. You know, I, I'm lost. I need See, you. That's what happens is people don't understand the work of the Holy Spirit. They're denying the power. Amen. And what I remember most, within five minutes after that incredible born again experience for me in my life, is realizing, well, wait a minute. Now God's real, the scripture's real, all this is real. I mean, really real. This isn't just some fantasy or fiction. This is real. And then I realized, wait a minute, that if, if God and Jesus and all this are real, then the devil's real too. <laughs> and I remember sitting there going, man, there really is somebody out there to get me. This is the word of God. <laughs> That's right. See, you can't have God and Jesus and all the scripture reverent without the devil and his demons. I mean, if, he, if God's presented as real, the devil and the demons are presented just as real. And that hit me like a brick that night. Yeah. And, and I said, oh, you know, there really was someone out to get me all this time. You know? It can be very frightening. Oh, yes. Yes, it, 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 it really is. The thought of it can be frightening. And, mm -hmm. and well, it's cosmic war we're in. We're in a cosmic war in this I would, world. I was going to that me those meetings and I would, my knees would be knocking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But once the fight started, once the battle started, yeah, yeah. No fear. Well, I know what you're talking about because when I had that one experience with that lady that night, when supernaturally she goes into my house, I know her, and grabs the one tape. Yeah. Of, and she'd never been in there. She couldn't have known which yeah. tape it was. There's hundreds of them. Yeah. And yet, within a few seconds, she had her hands on that one tape. It took six of us yeah. to try to hold her down. It was four to six. I was all the guys. And she was powerful. <laughs> and I remember trying to fry that tape. I she's trying to get that tape. And, and that same person yeah. had her hand around my neck. Yeah, yeah. Trying to choke me to death. That's right. And all I did was raise my hand That's like this. Right. And say, Lord Jesus. Amen. Because the power. Please make him the demon. Yeah. And remove his hands. Yeah, it's just like with the those Mormon missionaries, and of course I've done gone to Jehovah's Witness conventions and Jehovah's Witness Kingdom halls and and uh, the Christian Science reading rooms, and I, I sense that in almost all these demonic religions. Uh, and of course I just pray and trust the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit, and I've yeah, got no yeah. problems. The thing you have to understand, though, is that uh, as it was in Barbara Jackson. At some point, it's going to be with us. It may be the time, maybe when the Lord lets them take our lives. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not. But that's not the worst thing that can happen to you, right? <laughs> well, I had a heart surgery just uh, four years ago at the time of this filming we're doing, and uh, everybody's worried about me. Like I need a, a, a fibrillation of the heart, and mm -hmm. I was getting dizzy spells and all this stuff. And I've got pictures of me with all this stuff on my chest and all this stuff, but. Uh, Anyway, I was kind of excited at, at the time. I was thinking, man, I might get to go see the Lord here pretty soon. Maybe I'll be, you know, in other words, I'm kind of excited. If the Lord wants me to stay here, just like the Apostle Paul, I'll stay for your sakes, you know. But some people may not understand about Marvin Jackson. I said we were brothers and sisters. 
I didn't know it at the time, but they both named me in their wills as the executors of their estate. And it took me about four years to finally get all that done. Uh -huh. But one of their prayers, one of their consistent prayers, uh -huh. was that they all go, that they go together. Yep, and the Lord granted that. Of them, and, and, and that was a good prayer because neither of them would have been able to, they were so close and they were so, their marriage was so strong that I don't think either of them, of them, they would have be, they would have lived and they would have survived. But the Lord knows what's best. They and he granted them their, 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 their he, prayer. He and, mercifully took them home yes. together. Okay, many people may not know this, but I've got David Harrell here. He preached the sermon at Jackson and Barbara's funeral. And so those that would like to see this, uh, you'll see it there on your screen. You can go to YouTube. You can put in David's name uh, and. Of course, I'll give you the reference there, and you can find out more about that and Jackson. You did a, a good review during that sermon of a lot of things about Jackson and Barbara. So that was interesting thing about that particular sermon is that um, when they were when they were killed, I had uh, Max or somebody called me at two o'clock in the morning, and I got up and I drove out to Ben's house, and and I got there, and and Jackson and I had always had an agreement between the two of us that said. Whichever of us goes first, the other one has to preach their funeral. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's, so I went out there, and Max and, and Ben were there, and they were saying, and I told them what, what I just told you, and they said, well, that solves that question. It yeah. is. I went in to prepare for that sermon. I sat down at my computer with my word processor. In two hours, I had that sermon. Mm. No corrections, no deletions. Wow. No, and I've had more compliments on that sermon than any other sermon I've ever preached in my life. And I've got that sermon on YouTube yeah. through our YouTube channel. And so Two people, hours. And so I, 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 just, I wasn't, you know, I just happened to look at the clock when I started, happened to look at the clock when I finished. Yeah. I was taking dictation. Yes. Basically. Uh -huh. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That was great. So anyway, yeah. you know, one thing about Jackson at that funeral I always remember is when I saw him in the coffin, you know, it, to me, it looked like he had a smile on his face, like he was excited yeah. to be with the Lord. Yeah. You know, just looking at him there and calling, you see, that contentment, that kind of... Yeah, the, other, the other thing about it there, regarding what I was experiencing is I'm a very emotional person, and I was really, mm -hmm. and everybody knows that, and so people mm -hmm. were worried about how, you, how are you going to get through this? Mm -hmm. I didn't have, a, I may have had one slight break in my voice throughout the whole service. Mm -hmm. And I remember when you, I think you were the one that called me to yeah. tell him he was dead. Yeah. And I still remember Russ talking, you telling me about it, and I just learned it from you. Yeah. And even at that point, you were breaking up oh, yeah. in those yeah. few minutes on the phone because yeah. you're emotional. Yeah. And, but to get through an entire but sermon. The Lord, the Lord took me right through the sermon That's right. without my emotions interfering because That's right. that was a message he wanted to get out. That's right. I buried them together out in, mm -hmm. out in their, their hometown yeah. in, in Junction. Mm -hmm. I was able to do the, the, the burial service mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, the, and, through the power of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit. Amen. And, and that's Amen. all you can attribute it to. Yeah. What do you think about it? Well, me? look, without God and His power, we got nothing. Yeah. We, the, de the demons have more power than we oh, do yeah, right. uh, without the Spirit. Yeah. It's God's power within us. Yeah. That's why Jesus said you must be born again, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Yeah, I, uh, uh, when I look at myself, I'm a nothing and a nobody. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just a I'm wretched sinner saved by grace. Yeah. We all are. But, <laughs> but through, the, through the Holy Spirit, He's allowed me to do things and enable me to do things that I could never have done. Right, right. And that's just because of the love of God love for of his, God. his people, His children. Pours it out in our hearts. Amen. Because yeah. that, that love is eternal. Yeah. And He protects us from the evil yeah. one, like yes. it says yeah. in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that that's the one of the things Jesus evil. said. That's what it means. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. All right, brother. I, I, fantastic interview. I really Thank appreciate you, it. Uh, we'll get this... Uh, you know, I'm thinking now, I was going to, uh, I meant it to be a short clip for a longer video, but there's so much good information here. I think I'll make this into its own video and just still make a short clip out of this long one, but then I will, I will make a longer video in itself of just us having this discussion because there's a lot of great information here, but I don't want to, I don't want to make that other video so long that nobody yeah. can hang in there. So I, I will make this into its own independent well, video, but at the same time, I'll take a clip from it. Yeah. 
and put it in the I horn. Trust, I trust your judgment. Yeah, yeah well, right. well, <laughs> I'll, I try to go by the spirit yeah. in, in this thing. When you do that, you're in far better shape than yeah. doing it on your own power. So yeah. uh, praise the Lord. And I want to thank our video man behind the camera, Rafa Estrada. I don't see him, but uh, yeah. he did a great job. Uh, on holding the camera steady and hanging yeah. there with yeah. us. All right, brother. Not God bless you again. Thank you, brother. Take care. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Remember John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. No other way is going to be acceptable to God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit than his Son, Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. And look to his word, the Holy Scripture to hear from God. God bless you all. I'm Larry Wessel for Christian Answers with David Harrell. See you next time. Well, my viewers, this isn't the end of this particular video yet. I'm going to include from our original Haunted House video, which also had a segment in it about demon possession. I'm going to take that segment from the original Haunted House video that we did and include the demon possession section here for our viewers watching this video. So that's what's coming next. Also, one other thing to notice from the researcher newsletter, there on page five, number four, it says, what are the signs of demon possession? Definition, demon possession occurs when Satan himself or one or more demons enter the body of a non-Christian and take control of it and forces the person's mind into an unconscious state. In effect, an alien mind takes over the person. This mind will do the thinking, speaking, etc. When the demon or demons leave the person, that person does not generally remember anything that happened during the time of their possession. Moving to page 6, it says, A. In many cases, there are no outward signs until confronted by possible exorcism. That's Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. B, when there are outward manifestations of demon possessions, the most significant sign is that of an altered personality, which is usually evil and malicious. That's Mark chapter 5, verses 2 through 15. Some of the following may be signs of possession. One, dual or multiple personalities. Mark 5, 2 through 5, and verse 15. Two, different voices, genders, even languages. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. Three, the voice talks about the person it possesses. Mark chapter 5, verses 9 and following. Point four, you can talk with the demon directly. Mark chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Five, sudden suicidal or homicidal desires. Mark chapter 5, verse 5. Six, the demon will give you its name. Mark chapter 5, verse 9. 7. The evil personality leaves when commanded in Jesus' name and the person's normal personality resurfaces. That's Mark chapter 5, verse 18. And 8. Long-term depression or sudden ecstatic state. There's much more I could say about all this, but the viewers can simply look at the page as it goes down to get more information there. One of the men of God I like to listen to on Sermon Audio in his broadcast of Generations is Kevin Swanson. He does great uh, biblical analysis of current events, world events, political events, things of that nature. And I think at this moment that I'm doing this, he has over 4,000 messages on Sermon Audio from his Generations broadcast. Anyway, here he is doing a message that's pertinent to the subject of this video called Demon Possession on the Rise in the West, which he broadcast on May 8th, 2018. You know, one of the things that we have to watch out for is there, there is a fair amount of exorcism that is rep reputedly happening through priests belonging to the Sons of Sea of Exorcism Department, <laughs> and that's not healthy. No. You remember the Sons of Siva? Yeah, they uh, they were unable to cast out any demons. Yeah, Weren't they the ones that get got beat up and thrown out naked? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That was them okay. in the book of Acts. You remember they, they were saying in the name of Jesus, in the name of Paul, and the, um, the demon says, Paul, we know, and Jesus, Jesus we, we know, know. <laughs> but who are you? Right. So that's not a good position to be in. No. Yeah. 
But uh, but is there a rise of demonic activity in the Western world? And I, I have to I have to say there must be something of that. Now I treat that in my book Apostate, the men who destroyed the Christian West, because there are clear references on the part of the great philosophers of the 19th century, who were very instrumental in opening the floodgates to the sheer evil that has overcome the Western world. And these philosophers, many of whom would acknowledge Lucifer, they would talk about Lucifer. I'm talking about Mark Twain, Frederick Nietzsche, and John Paul Sartre, and, mm-hmm. and uh, Karl Marx. The, these, these men acknowledged it. It wasn't just other people saying it. They acknowledged their alliance with Satan. Mark, Mark Twain, for example, at the end of his life, wrote letters to the earth, which were letters penned from Satan himself to the archangels. And, wow. and he acknowledged that and told his daughter not to publish these or, you know, something terrible would happen. Now, they were published in the 1950s, I believe, some 40, 50 years after Mark Twain died. Now, of course, it's important for us to understand the influence that the uh, demonic world had on guys like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain, Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche, and others. There, there was tremendous spiritual satanic influence going on in America in the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln invited uh, witches into the White House. He and Franklin Pierce were the two presidents in the history of the United States that invited witches into the White House to conduct seances. People have said, and this is this is this is obvious historical records that we include in our upcoming American history course. Of that we are releasing called In God's Providence. But it's important for people to understand the history of America in terms of inviting satanic forces to operate in this country in the 19th century. So I think also the music business has been infiltrated by satanic influences. There should, should be almost no question about that because these musicians themselves acknowledge it. Remember David Bowie, who was in uh, the, the home of one of the members of the Led Zeppelin band, and he said the house was completely filled with dumb demons. Yeah, and he, he, I think he crawled out a window to try to get out of it. He says it was the most, it was a horrendous experience. Uh, so that's, of course, in my book, Apostate: The Men Who Destroy the Christian West, as well. Um, but, uh, but I think people need to understand that we have unleashed, we have welcomed, as a nation, as a nation, we have welcomed. Satanic influence through our philosophers, our literary giants, and our musical influences of the last 50, 60 years at least. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you, you had the rise of the death metal bands and things like that during the 80s and 90s, and I'm sure they're still going on now, too. Uh, Slayer was one of them who actually said that they were demon-possessed and that they worshipped Satan and things like that. It was just it was crazy. And it continues with Marilyn Manson and others as well. But friends, also one more reason why there's demonic activity in this country is because there's far less Christian influence in this country. You, you've, you interview the number of people who believe that the Bible is God's Word. It's dropped off from some 40% to 23%. So there's half, half of the people who claim the Bible was the Word of God in 1980. 37 years later, right now, there's only half of those people who would claim the Bible to be the Word of God today. Yeah, and even less that actually say that they right. live a biblical it's only lifestyle. Only five or five or six percent of millennials, five or six percent of millennials, that are evangelicals, and they take a position against homosexual marriage. Wow, five to six percent. So these people out there, these Christian ministries, that are pretending that American Christianity is still uh, this gigantic force in America, and we're going to make all kinds of progress with our ministries. No, no, no. We are. In the minority, my friends. Now, of course, we're, we're the David against Goliath and so forth. But I think we need to understand the cultural upper hand that homosexuality and sexual sin has had on this nation. When you have the Supreme Court of the United States legitimizing the killing of 100 million babies and legitimizing homosexual marriage, friends, this is the most abominable sin approved of by the most powerful principalities and powers in the nation. And you're saying Satan's not involved in this? Yeah. You're saying that Satan is not involved with Justice Kennedy in his decision to bring homosexual marriage into America? That is the Neronic vision from Caesar Nero that uh, appeared in AD 66, around the same time the Great Persecution was launched against the Christian Church. Are, are you saying that Satan is not involved at all in what is going with the Supreme Court of the United States? Friends, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against Justice Kennedy, primarily. 
we, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. So there's two traps, I think, that, that we need to watch out for, two ditches on this. The one is to ignore and uh, to, to take the demonic activity too lightly. On the other hand, some pl- overplay the power of the demonic world, and we don't want to do either of these. Yeah, and you can fall into either ditch. You can just deny that the spiritual realm exists except for God. But, I mean, if you're going to believe in God and believe in his word, he talks about angels and demons as well. But then you, there, there are some people out there that they see demons everywhere. <laughs> like, like what Brad Stein said, you know, the Catholic Church tends to see Mary everywhere, and a lot of the Protestants see demons everywhere. Yeah. And so, it's, and there's an over influence, uh, over emphasis upon uh, the demon world among some of the Protestants. I don't know why the Christian Church has gone towards paid counselors. You know, Jesus never said, "Give me five hundred bucks, I'll fix your marriage." Yeah, for fifty hundred bucks, I'll get you saved. You know, you don't get that from Jesus, do you? No. It just seems like there's something wrong with this approach. Jesus didn't say, okay, 70 guys, you guys want to cast out demons? Um, okay, it'll be three grand each. Um, Judas, where's the money bag? Where's the money bag, Judas? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's 210,000 bucks. So what we're going to do is we're going to train all 70 of you. Now, now we need 3,000 bucks from each of you. It's just something wrong with that. It seems to me there are some things that should not be monetized. Yeah, and and merchandised and all of that. Friends, what do you do when you've got demonic influences in your community or in your family? Or perhaps the church senses there's a demonic presence, there's a demonic influence that's going after somebody. What do you do? Do you you go around looking for the expert on exorcism, the guy who can pray the right prayers, the guy who's got the right recipe, the guy— or, or, or are we looking for somebody who, who has a relationship with Jesus? Yeah, who can preach the gospel. <laughs> yeah, he, he yeah. knows Jesus. He's been walking with Jesus. He, he's got faith. He's, got, he's, he's a man of prayer and fasting. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's the basic stuff. It's not, where's your certificate? Have you been certified <laughs> to be an exorcist? Yeah. We don't need that. We need a man of faith, a man filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Does that make sense? Am, am I being too simple here? And I don't think so. I, I, because... You know, he leads us into power. It, it, it's not us that does this. It's Christ in us by his Holy Spirit mm-hmm. that we could do anything. I find it interesting that Jesus didn't even do miracles until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Mm-hmm. And so it was by the Holy Spirit. So if we see any type of miracle, it's not because I laid hands on you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Christ in me by the Holy Spirit that you know is using his power through me. And when the disciples could not cast that big demon out of the little boy, you remember at the foot of the hill of the Mount of Transfiguration? Yeah. Uh, you remember he, he was upset. Jesus was upset. Jesus yeah. was saying, there's a lack of faith here. He said, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you could just move this mountain from right here to over there. He says, the issue is faith. And then he also said that this kind comes not out, but by prayer and fasting. So in other words, what are we looking for? We're looking for a man of faith. A man who is given to prayer and fasting. There's, there's somebody in the church who just, he's six, seven, eight hours a day in prayer and fasting. He hasn't attended Exorcism 101 and Exorcism 201 and 301 and give his three grand and got the certification. He doesn't have any of that. What he has is faith. Men of faith. Now, in lieu of not having faith, you might need a certificate. Yeah. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. You might need to go to the Sons of Siva School of you, Exorcism. You, yeah. you might need to, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, I wouldn't recommend that. No. I would not recommend that. A couple other things that come to my mind as we consider the the, the modern issue of exorcism, um, and that is, do we fear God first and foremost and recognize the absolute authority of the Lord Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father? And this certainly was the way with the apostles. They understood the authority of Jesus. Here, the other thing is, we need to be aware of whether there's conversion whether there's oppression or possession, I don't believe that Christians can be possessed. No. Uh, but there may be some who are seeking Jesus who are being oppressed and may be possessed. And so I think we, we need to be somewhat sensitive to the situation. Jesus said, you know, you cast out a demon out of the house, the seven worst ones will come back in if, if the house is empty. Right. And I think what he mean, means by that is if, if there's an individual who, who does not receive Jesus, he is not indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. He's been delivered of one, and yet he, the Holy Spirit of God has not entered into the man. 
he is subject to even worse problems in the future. So let's be sure that we're applying biblical truth uh, to the issue of Satan's involvement. And most important of all, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Indeed, David says, I come to thee not with the sword, not with the spear, not with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. And that's how he cast down that giant. And uh, we do the same thing. Uh, as Peter and John did in the temple. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So claim the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that is included in that name, the name of Jesus who's above all names, who is the power over all powers, who is above all principalities and powers, and he's above all things to the church, uh, claim the power and the influence and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as, you, uh, as you get involved in these spiritual battles. Now let's hear from Dr. Walter Martin again on current demonic activity. But something strange happened that night. A young lady was sitting in the service watching me the whole time, didn't take her eyes off me. And then after the service, a gentleman came up and said, there's a girl in the audience, young married lady, who has a problem we'd like to talk to you about. I said, well, I'm rather tired. I'm, my time clock hasn't caught up yet from my flight from the East. Uh, is it very important? Yes, it is somewhat important. What's the problem? Well, she's been dealing with a Christian psychologist for some time. And last night we had a very interesting session with her. There were voices and all kinds of peculiar behavior, and uh, the psychologist has revised some of his opinions, and uh, we think that we've got a case of demon possession on our hands, but we don't know. But you will know. Would you please come and talk with her? I said, all right, I'll talk with her. Well, that began an entire evening that will forever remain memorable. I drove from that church, and the couple drove with me in the car, and two or three other people who had been concerned. This girl, daughter of a missionary, raised in a foreign land, early exposed to demon worship, and then at a point in her life, later find out, to find out, actually a worshiper of Satan, living the Christian life in a Christian church, pretending to be a Christian, the perfect tear in the wheat field. Exactly as the Scripture says. When we got to the parking lot of the motel, suddenly I had an overwhelming sense of evil. And I said to the man driving the car, Stop the car, we've got to pray now. So he jammed on the brakes. <laughs> didn't have any safety belt. I'm glad I didn't visit the windshield. And I bowed my head and prayed. I didn't know that the car next to us was the car that this young girl was in. And when I began to pray, she went semi-catatonic. Stiff in the seat, couldn't move. Later she told us that she knew everything that was going on, but she was totally incapable of mobility. And then very strange sounds began to come out of her. She didn't want to move out of that seat. I came down out of the car and I walked over and took one look and knew instantaneously what we were dealing with. And I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, They do not want you to leave the car, but if you leave the car, Jesus Christ will set you free. And we took her and lifted her bodily from the car and half walked, half carried her to that motel room. And the moment we got inside the motel room, we had a repetition of the Gospel of Matthew. It took four strong men to hold a five-foot, three-inch girl down on a bed. I know because I was holding one leg, and there was a force in her lifting her right off the bed, and her whole body was shaking, her face contorted, and the noises coming out of her were, well, we might use the word unhealthy. Finally, she relaxed for a moment and began to pray. 
Well, we started to pray, and we were there three hours praying. And while we were praying, we had an interesting conversation with the occupants of her body. It seems they had been there for a long time, and they were not about to leave. The psychologist who didn't believe in demon possession when he came in was a thorough convert in five minutes. <laughs> Revolutionized his ministry. The new man. It takes only one encounter with the Holy Spirit and a good shot of the devil, and you're in business. You know what's going on. And he knew. To his credit, he knew. And we started to pray. And every time we would invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as it is recorded here in the book of Acts, I would say, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. Come out. The body would jackknife into the air, and we'd have to hold her down again. This went on. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The girl was exhausted. And then, every once in a while, in the middle of the conversation, we'd hear, no, 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 no. And then finally, I'll outlast you. I can outlast you. I won't come out. We won't come out. Sandwiched in the dialogue. Those words. Enough to frighten anybody. I'm glad we had witnesses. So everybody knows what was said. Finally, after two and a half hours of praying on our knees, she sat up and said, Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> she said, uh, uh, I'm ready to go home now. And she smiled and she was her old self and she started to get off the bed and the psychologist <laughs> grabbed her and he said, You are not going anywhere. And the other fellow on the other side grabbed her and the two of us grabbed her legs and the moment... We grabbed her. The whole thing began all over again. Now, this is how clever are the forces of darkness. I'm fine. I feel good. I want to go home. Buzz off. Leave me alone. But the moment you can't be fooled anymore, right back again, just like a light switch, to the same behavior pattern all over again. So finally, we were praying for her, and we asked her to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. If you could see that girl's body... On that bed, her vocal cords trying to get the name Jesus through her lips. It was incredible. Just trying to say the name Jesus. And I kept saying to her, you have to call on him. Now, we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed. You call on the Master. And finally, through this almost clenched lips, Lord Jesus Set me free. Oh. And she fell back on the bed. A minute later, I said to her, pray to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness for praying to the devil. She said, I can't, I can't. I said, try. Slowly, for another half hour, prayer, prayer, prayer. Finally, her prayer to Christ. Of forgiveness. And then the third stage. Renounce Satan and everything he stands for. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This time there wasn't any hesitation. I renounce you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then she was free. She was really free. She got off that bed and she said, They're gone. They're gone. She grabbed her husband and hugged him. The first time in 20 years, she was free. And then she turned around and did she open our eyes? Her own mother was possessed. Some of her friends were possessed and she knew who they were. And one of them now, beginning to feel the impact of prayer. She said, they've been there all my life almost. She said, I was so frightened of them because they said they'd kill me if I ever told. She said, I couldn't move in the car tonight, Dr. Martin. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't turn. I couldn't get off that seat. She said, 
When you put your hand on my shoulder, she said, I, I wanted to turn, I wanted to move, I wanted to get out, I wanted to walk into that room. I knew I could be free. Couldn't. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me talk. They tied my throat and my tongue, my whole body. I couldn't move. She said, and when I got into the room, then I knew. She said, and that's when it all started. But Jesus Christ has set me free. Now, we followed that girl for almost a week now. Her husband reports, brand new girl, brand new home, brand new mother, brand new Sunday school teacher. Hallelujah. Now, you don't have to go to Africa to find the doctrine of the demons, and you don't have to go to Africa to find the demons. Africa, South America, the dark continents of the world, none are darker than America. For where men have turned from the living God, they have opened themselves to the doctrine of the demons. And within them, the powers of darkness move. Therefore, let us learn from this. These forces are here and they are real. Should you care to doubt me on it, I'd be happy to introduce you to a consulting psychologist who's a new convert to this. <laughs> and to four other people and to a brand new lady who, when she wants to, will give her own testimony, but has not prohibited me from mentioning the case. That is the case, and I could spend the evening giving you more and more and more. As I said this morning, Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth. The following is a clip from our video series called Blasphemous, Charismatic, and Pentecostal Mayhem. This is from show number four, where I appear with Rob Zins from Dallas Theological Seminary. Well, anyway, let me read you some of this stuff from Kurt Koch, finally, from, uh, on Walter Martin's recommendation. Right here on page 27, as you can see it on your screen, the Holy Spirit and alien spirits. The late Friedrich Heitmuller, the head of the Holstein Wall Congregation in Hamburg, apparently this is in Germany, uh, coined the term hybrid spirits. This expression can be taken in two ways, one wrong and the other right. It would be wrong to suppose that the Holy Spirit could dwell together with demonic spirits in a man. That is impossible, and Heitmuller did not mean it that way. This expression means rather that alien spirits frequently from the very lowest depths give themselves out to be the Holy Spirit. Here we encounter once more the words of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and you quoted it earlier. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. End quote. There are classic examples how unholy spirits can turn up in biblical disguise and lead men astray. I will mention a few. Among those whose language is German, the books of Jacob Lawyer, 1800 to 1864, has spread much confusion. Lorber, a native of Austria, was not only a mystic, but also a spiritist medium. He wrote the so-called Great Gospel of John and the Son of the Spirit. In my pastoral work, I have become familiar with the devastating effects of this devout spiritualist. In the English-speaking world, the best known of these hybrid spirits is probably Harry Edwards. He, too, is a spiritualist medium. He wrote the book Spiritual Healing. Edwards speaks of heavenly gods, his angels, without whom he could do nothing. What is seductive about him is the way he cloaks his demonic effects in a robe of Christian piety so that even many Christians and Anglican clergy go to him for advice and assistance. In America, Edward Casey deserves mention. In his theories, he resembles Jacob Lorber. Like Lorber, for example, he espouses reincarnation and asserts, like Lorber, that his powers and spiritual insights are of divine origin. As mentioned before in the previous clip you heard from our Blasphemous, Charismatic, and Pentecostal Mayhem series, number four, about demonic activity going on inside the so-called Christian church. Well, Walter Martin loves the author, Kurt Koch, when it comes to expertise on the occult. And Kurt Koch wrote another book called Occult ABC. And in this book, on page 49, we read, starting 
from point two near the bottom of the page. It says, the reactions of mentally ill persons and those who are demon possessed are different. I will not repeat here what I have already publicized in other books. In my book, Demonology Past and Present, page 136, I have listed eight symptoms of possession. Here I mention only three of the chief ones. A, attacks of madness, which occur only when spiritual counsel is offered. Several Christian workers can testify to such incidents. I was called in to see a woman who began to rave every time someone prayed with her. The same thing happened when I did so. In such cases, it is my practice to command the spirit in the name of Jesus. B, the trance. If one tries to pray with people who have come under an evil influence as a result of spiritism, they go straight into a trance. Now looking here on page 50, we see at the top of the page. Example 47, a minister in Zurich brought a woman to me for counseling. When I prayed with her, she went into a trance and stuck her tongue out at me. When I said, Amen, she came to herself. I asked her whether she had been to any spiritist seances. She said she had. She had belonged to a spiritist group for the past nine years. C. Speaking in unknown languages. In the Ritual Romanum, speaking in an unknown language is also regarded as a sign of possession. One day a young man came to me for counseling. While we were praying, he went into a trance and the voices which came from him used foreign languages which he had not learned. This is the strongest argument against the view of the psychiatrist. A person who is mentally ill does not suddenly speak foreign languages which he has not learned. Now as we get ready to go to some actual video clips of people in so-called charismatic and Pentecostal churches, and then to see what happens in Hindu services and also voodoo witch doctor services, we see an uncanny resemblance of the same kind of phenomenon. Now, right before we look at these, I want you to notice here on the screen this pamphlet that we have where we compare 11 groups with biblical Christianity. It's entitled Christianity, Cults, and the Occult. And in here you can see that this pamphlet covers Christianity, Freemasonry, Kabbalah Center, Wicca, Satanism, Spiritualism, Santeria, Voodoo, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, Astrology and Horoscopes, and more. So the reason I'm showing you this, and this is available if you contact our ministry, free of charge. We're not in this for the, the money at all. We're just trying to help people understand what the Bible says about these, these things. But anyway, the uncanny similarity in demonic activity between all these groups, for instance, listed here, and what's supposed to be Christianity, such as these Pentecostal and charismatic groups claim to be, is what I would say is nothing more than pure demonic activity going on. Whether you're in voodoo, Hinduism, or so-called Pentecostal or charismatic Christianity, the results are the same. Now we're beginning this collage of video clips from ritualistic meetings. In this case, we're seeing Hindu ritualistic meetings. And here you see in these clips from Hindu services out of India, the same kind of phenomenon that you see will prove later in this collage of videos that these Hindu rituals are very similar to what we see in modern charismatic and Pentecostal activity in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Demonic activity obviously is taking place in these primitive and animistic religions or in this case Hinduism. And of course nobody from a Christian perspective would say that these Hindu rituals and the phenomenon associated with them are of the Holy Spirit or are biblical in any sense of the word. Yet we see the phenomenon here being very similar to what we see in charismatic and Pentecostal circles. You've got the guru putting his hand on people's heads and suddenly they're infused with some kind of spirit that is supposedly overwhelming them with love or whatever it might be that possesses them. Well, 
I think it starts to become obvious that in some cases, if you were to just play some of this stuff for people, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a Hindu service, a charismatic service, whereas the last clip in this collage of videos will show voodoo witch doctor ritualistic occurrences and phenomenon, people rolling around on the ground and so forth, losing possession of their own body. But anyway, hopefully this proves the point on this situation. You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. And wait till they come to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Toronto. Leave us to ourselves. Don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking. Lord, we want all that you have, all, yes. all that you have. Yes. And Lord, if it blows our little minds, let them be blown. <laughs> Father, we want all of what you have, all of what you have. We thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord just reminded me of the old hymn where he leads, I will follow. And he had a, God told me to look at him, and I looked at him. And he had a tie on, and on, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he'll know, on the tie had a wolf howling at the moon. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. He said, if I ask you, will you do it? He said, if I can't ask you to do something in your own house, how are you going to do it out there? So, After hearing from Kevin Swanson and Walter Martin, I'd like to take a moment here to mention my own encounter with a demon-possessed person at a group Bible study. You can find my full description of it on my video posted on YouTube called Demonic Possession Case, Dealing with the Devil, What Jesus Has Done to Satan. It was quite amazing and is something I am thankful I do not have to deal with on a daily basis. Recently, a good Christian friend and brother of mine who was there the night of the demon possession event happened to email me about another subject he wanted biblical information on. He had moved from Austin over 20 years ago, but still kept in contact with me through the internet. I took the opportunity to ask him if he could write a short one paragraph description of that night so I could include it in this haunted house video. His response was as follows. These are coming from his email. 
With regard to the paragraph you want me to write, I need to pray about it. That experience was quite traumatic to me, and I rarely think about it. When it comes to the realm of darkness, I do not tread lightly upon it. If God directs me, I will send you something. But I appreciate you thinking about me for this. And then he sent me another email a couple of days later or so, and here's what he said. With regard to the demonic incident, I have prayed about it, and I realize that I have such little remembrance of it that I am not sure what is true or not. I do not want to provide false information, especially in this area, so I think it best not to contribute to it. You were there and probably were more aware of things than I was. Jackson did not elaborate too much about it afterwards, probably because he was trying to protect the woman's reputation. I always wonder if she ever got saved and was released from that horrible condition. I want to give special thanks to Rafa Estrada, a member of Day Spring Fellowship here in Austin, Texas, for doing the video work in the interview with David Harrell and Larry Wessels about demon possession. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.